So um, the topic I'm going to be presenting on is demyelinating and infectious diseases of the spine. So I have no conflicts of interests or disclosures, firstly. So the objectives of this uh, presentation are going to be to describe the clinical and imaging features of different causes of intrinsic spinal cord abnormality and to develop a systematic algorithmic approach to evaluating myelopathy on MRI with focus on demyelinating conditions involving the cord. And the second part of the presentation is going to review the pathophysiology, the common radiological findings and follow ups for the more common causes of spinal infection and how to exclude potential mimickers. So myelopathy is a broad term that relates to spinal cord dysfunction. Uh, differential diagnosis will include many di diseases that affect the spinal cord, such as compressive etiologies, infections, inflammatory um, demyelinating conditions, autoimmune etiologies, vascular anomalies, and finally in So clinic evaluation, including physical exam and laboratory investigation are a cornerstone of workup with radiology providing an edge. So MRI plays a key role in evaluation of suspected myelopathy to delineate the cause and extent. So let's review the spinal cord anatomy um, before proceeding. Um, we know that the spinal cord uh, lies within the subarachnoid space. The central H-shaped structure is the gray matter and the external uh, is the white matter. And the nerve roots float in the subarachnoid space, which is filled with CSF. And uh, it is bounded by the dura or the theca. And external to that, we have the epidural space, which contains fat. Uh, this is the anterior vertebral body, um, which um, adjacent to which is the intervertebral disc. And posteriorly, we have the posterior elements. So this is an algorithmic approach to evaluate for T2 hyperintensity or myelopathy in the cord. Firstly, we're going to exclude any artifactual causes and any compressive causes from either discs or ostephytes. And in the non-compressive causes, after clinical evaluating, whether the patient presented acutely or non-acutely, um, demyelinating conditions can have either expensile or non-expensile appearance. And the other acute uh, conditions involve um, infarctions and infections, which usually present with a non-expensile signal abnormality. In the non-acute causes, we have the expensile signal abnormalities, which are obviously concerning for neoplasias, and the non-expensile signal abnormalities, which include uh, various metabolic, neurodegenerative, and um, inflammatory immune-mediated causes. So, um, characterizing myelopathy, um, firstly, we have to um, characterize whether it is short segment or long segment. The short segment myelopathies, they span less than three vertebral body segments in craniocardial dimensions. And the long segment myelopathies uh, span more than three vertebral body segments. So the short segments uh, myelopathies are commonly seen in MS and the partial form of transverse myelitis. And the long segment involvement is usually seen in the complete form of transverse myelitis, neuromyelitis optica, and acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. So demyelinating disorders of the spine. Um, MS is obviously characterized by multi-episodic disease. Uh, you're going to see oligoclonal bands in the CSF. And um, uh, this, according to the McDonald's criteria, there's going to be dissemination of lesions in both time and space that is involving both um, more than two parts of the CNS. The brain lesions in MS are typically periventricular in location and juxtacortical in location. Um, lesions in EDM are typically bilateral, bilateral and symmetrical uh, there's going to be large confluent lesions that can involve the deep gray matter, that is the basal ganglia and the thalami. They can involve the brain stem, and there is relative sparing of the periventricular region. So ADEM also presents as a single um, episodic disease with signs of encephalopathy, usually occurs after a viral illness or infection. 
and CSF analysis will usually show pleocytosis and uh, usually there will be absence of oligoclonal bands. Uh, in 50% of cases, the anti-MOG antibodies are going to be positive in CSF. The neuromyelitis optica spectrum um, will present with visual symptoms because the optic nerves are affected and um, the serum or CSF aquaporin-4 antibodies are going to be present which are a specific biomarker for the disease. Transverse myelitis will also present with an abrupt single episodic disease. Uh, the laboratory investigations are not specific and in cases where it does recur, it may be a precursor to MS. So let's start with MS. It's the most common demyelinating disease, uh, especially in the West and in geographical areas further from the equator. Um, it has a female preponderance with a uh, ratio 2 is to 1. The peak age of onset is around 35 years. And lesions can be found in the spinal cord on autopsy in approximately 99% of cases with MS. And the brain lesions, as we know, are typically oriented perpendicular to the uh, ependymal surface and the callosoceptal interface, giving the characteristic dorsal fingers. So let's talk about the cord abnormalities in MS. There's three types of abnormalities observed. They're the focal well-demarcated lesions, which are the most commonly observed. And then there's diffuse abnormalities seen as poorly demarcated areas of uh, spinal cord abnormality. And thirdly, we have the atrophic or axonal loss phase. So um, coming on to the focal lesions, they are typically short segment that is less than 1.5 vertebral body segment in craniocaudal length and peripherally located. So they're going to be either wedge-shaped, rounded, or triangular, and they're going to span less than half of the cross-sectional area of the cord. So in these um, T2-weighted sequences, you can see multiple peripherally eccentric located lesions uh, either they're triangular or rounded in the um, predominantly in the dorsal or posterior uh, aspect of the cord. They can also be seen laterally. And on sagittal views, they're going to be cigar shaped. So most commonly the lesions occur in this uh, cervical cord and the location of the lesions corresponds to the venous drainage areas therefore uh, giving rise to the perivenular distribution of MS plaques. So uh, again, on these images, you can see multifocal uh, short segment lesions, uh, which are conspicuous on these stir images in the posterior aspect of the co cervical cord. And on the cross-section axial image, you can see that there is a triangular wedge-shaped lesion in the um, dorsum of the cord, which is characteristic for MS. On contrast imaging, the active plaques can enhance because of breakdown of the blood cord barrier. And the cord enhancement pattern is not going to be very specific and is also not as common as that in the brain. So the three types of enhancement patterns you can see are the ring enhancement pattern as seen in this image. Um, this is another image showing the intense enhancement in a cigar shaped lesion. And the third enhancement pattern is the vague or less intense enhancement pattern, which is the most commonly observed as seen in this image. So the second type of abnormalities observed in MS are the diffuse abnormalities. These are less common. And in this case, there will be diffuse uh, involvement of the cord spanning a long segment uh, of the cord. And in this case, the uh, differential diagnosis will be tough and will include uh, transverse myelitis, neuromyelitis optica, ADEM, and in some cases, even extensive astrocytoma. So this pattern is more common in the primary and secondary progressive forms of MS. And the third pattern is the atrophy and axonal loss. Um, this is seen in long-standing cases and is associated with a worse clinical disability. And this pattern is seen in the chronic uh, relapsing remitting forms of MS. So uh, on these images, you can see that there is thinning of the cord in multiple locations where the plaques are present. So this indicates the atrophic or axonal loss pattern of MS. So let's move on to neuromyelitis optica. 
It's also called uh, Derek's disease. It is an autoimmune demyelinating disease induced by a specific autoantibody, which is the NMO IgG. Once detected, this is a specific biomarker for the disease. Um, it preferentially affects the optic nerves and the spinal cord. However, the lesions do not have to occur synchronously. Uh, this has a higher female preponderance with the ratio approaching six is to one. And the age of onset is also higher, 41 years in comparison to 35 years of MS, and the disease has a severe course. So the demyelination in the cord is going to look uh, extensive and going to span more than four to seven vertebral segments. So it's going to be a long segment myelopathy. It can involve full transverse diameter of the cord. There can be cord expansion as well. And the pattern of enhancement is also variable. So in this case, you can see that there is extensive signal abnormality in the cord. There are some T2 hyperintense cystic appearing areas in the thoracic cord as well. And the abnormality reaches up to the cervical medullary junction. On post contrast sequences, you can see confluent nodular type of ill defined enhancement in both these images. And these are axial T1 post contrast images, again showing some nodular areas of ill defined enhancement. So, in this case, a differential could be raised for either a neoplastic lesion of the spinal cord or demyelination. Luckily, this patient also underwent an MRI brain and uh, there was intense enhancement appreciated in the optic nerves and the NMO IgG was positive, therefore rendering the diagnosis of Devic's disease. So bright spotty lesions are uh, a specific feature of NMO if they are observed. Uh, these are markedly hyper intense T2 signals that is higher than that of the adjacent CSF in the center of the gray matter. So in, this, in these images, you can see that there is characteristic H-shaped appearance um, of the gray matter, which is diffusely hyper intense on T2, uh, giving rise to the bright spotty lesions. And there is um, diffuse involvement that is more than two thirds of the um, transverse diameter of the cord is involved. And the lesions span to involve uh, often the medullary junction and brainstem as well. So again, on these sagittal sequences, you can see a long segment myelopathy involving the thoracic cord. And on post contrast images, there is minimal or vague enhancement. On this image, you can see that there is involvement of the brainstem and cervical medullary junction. So the brain lesions in NMO are uh, often distinct from that of MS and uh, therefore important to evaluate. In NMO, there are going to be no cerebral white matter lesions uh, present in contrast to MS. And um, in NMO, you're going to see absent cranial nerve and cerebellar involvement in contrast to MS. And I, again, the location of the lesions in NMO is predominantly around the ventricles, where the aquaporin-4 channels are present in highest concentration. So on these flare sequences, you can see that the lesions of um, NMO are located around the ventricles. So this is a, a, along the anterior aspect of the fourth ventricle. You can see lesions along the foramen of Monroe and the third ventricle. And uh, on this post-contrast um, coronal sequences, you can see enhancing plaques along the periventricular regions of the um, lateral ventricles. Additionally, you can see in this patient that there is diffuse involvement of the right optic nerve, which is swollen and T2 hyper intense in contrast to the left optic nerve, which is normal. So moving on to transverse myelitis, it is characterized by bilateral motor sensory and autonomic disturbances. Uh, it's usually a para-infectious cause, which is implicated when no apparent underlying cause is identified, it is referred to as idiopathic. And the thoracic spine is most commonly involved. Middle-aged adults are usually affected. And um, approximately 40% of patients with transverse myelitis can have radiologically occult disease. So these are a list of diseases associated with transverse myelitis. We have the para-infectious causes, which can include viral and bacterial causes. 
post vaccinal causes have been implicated and uh, systemic autoimmune diseases such as lupus, Sjogren's, and sarcoidosis have also been associated with transmyelitis. So imaging findings, uh, again, it's going to in involve more than two thirds of the cross-sectional area of the cord. Cord expansion may or may not be present and enhancement uh, may or may not be present. It is usually absent. So in these images, you can see that there is more than two thirds of the cross-section area of the cord involved, and there is a long segment myelopathy. There are two types of transverse myelitis. There's the acute partial transverse myelitis, which spans less than three vertebral segments, and this is uncommon. However, when this occurs, there's a risk for developing MS in the future. And there's the acute complete transverse myelitis, which is the more common form. And this uh, presents with a long segment that is more than three vertebral body segments myelopathy. So on these uh, images, you can see that there is a long segment D2 hyperintense signal abnormality involving the thoracic cord. This is more conspicuous on the STIR images and it spans more than four to seven vertebral body segments. And on post-contrast images, you can see barely uh, any enhancement within the abnormality. These are another, uh, this is another example of a uh, long segment, um, complete form of transverse myelitis involving the cervical spine. There is expensile signal abnormality in this case. And um, on post-contrast images, you can see little or minimal enhancement. So typical for transverse myelitis on imaging is that the um, initial MR will show abnormalities that are usually quite extensive and they are, they are less or completely resolved on follow-up images. So this was a patient with a uh, long segment transverse myelitis. Um, follow-up done after four to six weeks showed um, complete, almost complete resolution of the imaging findings. So the clinical outcome is that one third of patients with transverse myelitis recover with little or no sequelae. One third are left with moderate degree of uh, permanent disability and one third have severe disabilities. Coming on to ADEM, um, it is an infectious, uh, sorry, it's an uh, inflammatory demyelinating disease of the CNS, mostly seen in children and young adults. Uh, it is an autoimmune response to myelin basic protein triggered by infection or immunization. So in 75% of patients, there's going to be a clear infectious event or vaccination event that is preceding one to four weeks after the disease onset. So it's in 90% of cases, it's a monophasic illness. Um, in 10% of cases where there is multiphasic illness, it cannot be differentiated from MS. So as I mentioned, in 50% of patients with ADEM, the anti-MOG IgG antibody is positive. So this is a reactivity against the myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein. And the CSF findings are often nonspecific. Um, usually there's gonna be absence of oligoclonal bands, but they can be detected in up to 29% of patients. Imaging findings, um, involvement of brainstem and spinal cord occurs in approximately one third of patients with ADEM. And the lesions are usually ill-defined, large, and extend over long segment of the spinal cord with cord expansion, as you can see in this image, and there's usually no enhancement. So um, in these images, you can see involvement of the cervical as well as the thoracic cord, and there are characteristic bilateral deep gray matter lesions involving the um, thalami, confirming the diagnosis. So the brain lesions um, in ADEM, um, are distinct from that of MS. Um, what is typical for ADEM is that there can be massive involvement of the brain stems, particularly the pons, which is not usually seen in MS. And involvement of the deep gray matter, that is the basal ganglia and the thalami, are commonly seen in ADEM and uncommon um, in MS. And there may be confluent cortical, large confluent cortical lesions in ADEM and there are usually smaller juxtacortical lesions in MS. Again, um, a, a patient with uh, ADEM showing massive involvement of the pons, 
there is involvement of the deep gray matter, the uh, right-sided basal ganglia, the thalami as well. And there are some uh, confluent appearing cortical-based lesions, as you can see here. And there's a long segment involvement of the cervical thoracic cord. And follow-up done after four weeks showed uh, interval resolution of the imaging findings. So um, uh, just to mention about subacute combined degeneration, it is usually characterized as a metabolic um, phenomena. However, it can lead to exonal loss and demyelination in cases of severe vitamin D B12 deficiency and therefore worth a mention. So what we're gonna see on MRI is that the characteristic bilateral T2 hyperintense areas involving the posterior column, giving the inverted V sign appearance. So over here, you can see on the axial T2 weighted uh, MR, the inverted V sign spanning the posterior aspect of the cervical cord. And this is important to diagnose because after vitamin B12 supplementations, these patients show marked clinical and radiological improvement. To, so, uh, to summarize, the plaques of AS, uh, MS are asymmetric, eccentric, peripherally located either dorsally or laterally. They can be wedge-shaped or rounded, and they're going to be short segment abnormalities. Uh, the cervical cord is the most commonly affected. In ADEM, they are going to be variable um, uh, lesions that can be confluent and large and span more than half of the cross-section area of the cord. There's going to be long segment myelopathy, and the thoracic spine is more commonly affected. In NMO, more than two thirds of the diameter of the cord is involved and the central cord, that is the central gray matter is preferentially affected, giving rise to the bright spotty lesions as I discussed. And there's gonna be long segment myelopathy with the cervical cord being commonly affected and extension into the brainstem can also be seen. With transverse myelitis, more than two thirds of the diameter of the cord is again involved. There's going to be long segment myelopathy and the cervical thoracic and thoracic spine is most commonly affected. So now coming on to the second part of the presentation, which are the spinal infections. So <clears throat> infection in the spine can involve the vertebrae, um, giving rise to spondylitis or intradiscal abscesses. Uh, the adjacent intervertebral disc space may be infected. Uh, giving rise to discitis or intradiscal abscesses. The adjacent paraspinal soft tissues and musculature may be involved uh, with resultant psoas abscess. There may be extension of uh, infection within the epidural space, giving rise to either phlegmon or um, uh, epidural abscesses. And uh, the facet joints may be uh, infected, uh, resulting in septic arthritis. And finally, substance of the cord may be involved itself, giving rise to infectious myelitis and intramedullary abscess, which is the rare, rare form of infection. So the proximity of the um, spinal column to uh, critical structures uh, in the vicinity, including the mediastinum and aorta, make, the accurate, uh, make accurate and early diagnosis very important to prevent complications. So let's talk about spondylitis and spondylodiscitis. Uh, uh, there are three routes of uh, spread of infection that are implicated. The hematogenous spread via arterial uh, networks is due to infected microemboli into the end metaphyseal arteries, which causes infarction and results in secondary infection. So the end plates are commonly affected in spondylitis because the vascular supply is the most abundant at the site. The adult disc is nearly avascular, which uh, therefore precludes blood-borne immune def defense mechanisms at the site. The second route of infection is via the venous spread, which is the Batson epidural venous plexus. Uh, the, uh, this, uh, this also accounts for retrograde spread of infection from abdominal and pelvic organs, such as in UTI, and it's also the preferred route of uh, spread of infection in fungal and tuberculous infections. So direct extension is the third uh, mode of uh, spread. 
It can be seen in patients uh, in the setting of penetrating trauma, open wounds, surgical intervention or instrumentation. Risk factors we all know are uh, gonna uh, include um, malnutrition, substance abuse, um, chronic conditions, malignancy, et cetera, diabetes, mellitus. CRP, ESR, and procalcitonin are specific inflammatory biomarkers uh, that are used for osteomyelitis. So let's talk about pyogenic spondylodiscitis, that is uh, the bacterial causes. Um, lumbar spine is the most commonly affected, followed by the thoracic spine. So gram-positive foci, which are the staph aureus, are most common. Uh, e. coli is the most common gram-negative source. Pseudomonas can be seen in IV drug users. Salmonella can be seen in patients with sickle cell disease. CT findings of spondylodiscitis, um, there, there can be local osteopenia, cortical bone erosion as seen in this image with lytic fragmentation. You can see bony chips in the soft tissues and there can be reactive bony sclerosis as well. There can be destruction of the intervertebral disc space. And when the adjacent uh, spinal soft tissues are involved, there can be loss of the uh, fat planes and soft tissue swelling as seen in this image. So CT is a useful tool in um, guiding the radiologist for either percutaneous drainage of fluid collections or to perform a biopsy, both for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. So MR um, is the most sensitive for spondylodiscitis. Earliest imaging finding will be bone marrow edema, that is T2 hyperintense and T1 hypointense signals, uh, most commonly along the uh, end, plate, end plates. And subsequently, there's going to be loss of end plate definition, that is the cortex of the end plate will be indistinct. And once the intervertebral disc space is infected, uh, it may show increased T2 signal intensity and uh, an abnormal configuration or shape of the infected disc. So use of fat suppression techniques, specifically the stir techniques, provides the highest sensitivity to detect the infect, uh, infected tissue that is uh, detect the increased water content. So uh, there's a, a sign known as the MRI SOAS sign. Um, that is observed uh, within the paraspinal uh, musculature that is in the SWAS. Uh, it refers to edema or fluid in the SWAS musculature, which is a finding that is consistent with early spondylodiscitis. Uh, this is an important finding because this may precede even the osseous destructive changes that are evident on MRI. So if this is present, as you can see in th on the right-sided SWAS muscle in this image, uh, it can serve as a feasible biopsy target and uh, a biopsy can be performed and this can be, um, this can be used to confirm the infection and guide for antibiotic treatment. So infection in um, pyogenic spondylodiscitis uh, first affects the subchondral region of the uh, vertebral body and plates, as I mentioned. Um, there's going to be anterior to posterior direction of spread. And over time, the bacteria with uh, virulent and proteolytic properties, uh, they cause end plate cortical destruction and invade into the intervertebral disc. Uh, spread along the arterial and asthmatic uh, networks can occur, uh, giving rise to sometimes non-contiguous vertebral body infections, also called the skipped lesions in pyogenic uh, spondylitis. Um, there may be extension into the epidural space as well by the arterial and asthmatic network. So this was a 73-year-old man with a history of back pain. Um, you can see that there is um, indistinct cortex of the inferior end plate of L3 vertebra anteriorly. So there's a anterior subchondral um, infection of the end plate. And you can see abnormal configuration of the adjacent intervertebral disc space, which is diffusely T2 hyperintense, suggesting discal involvement. And uh, additionally, you can see that there is fluid in the right-sided SWAS. So this was confirmed MRSA pyogenic spondylodiscitis. 
These are uh, images from another patient with pyogenic spondylodiscitis, in which you can see that there's extensive marrow edema with T2 hyperintense signals and T1 hyperintense signals in these two uh, contiguous vertebrae with a T2 hyperintense signal abnormality in the adjacent intervertebral disc. And on post contrast images, there's intense enhancement of the vertebrae and there's abnormal configuration of the intervertebral disc. And there's also this epidural soft tissue, which is compressing upon the um, tickle sac and the cord, distal cord. Another case of um, pyogenic spondylodiscitis, CT images are sh showing uh, end plate erosions and destruction. Uh, there's some reactive patchy sclerosis along the end plates. And MR images are showing intense enhancement in the intervertebral disc space, as well as within the paraspinal soft tissues. You can see that there's this ill-defined area of enhancement appreciated in the um, posterior mediastinum. And additionally, you can see that there's this non-enhancing area that is concerning for a small abscess in the posterior mediastinum. You can see that the borders of the abscess are diffusely thick walled and enhancing as well. So this was um, pyogenic spondylodiscitis at T2, T3 level with posterior mediastinal abscess. These are, uh, this is another image of, from pyogenic discitis osteomyelitis. Again, you can see intense enhancement of the two involved vertebrae with end plate um, destruction and intervertebral disc space involvement. So um, sections from this uh, intervertebral disc space, um, the DWI images are um, performed in this case. And you can see that there is diffusion restriction within the disc space itself. So bright signals on DWI drop out on ADC map. So this suggests that there is an intradiscal abscess formation. On the axial post-contrast sequences, you can see intense um, enhancing inflammatory phlegmon involving the uh, pre-vertebral uh, soft tissues, the paravertebral soft tissues. There's also extension along the anterior epidural space as well with mild uh, compression over the spinal cord. And you can see that this uh, phlegmon, it surrounds the descending aorta as well. It encases it. So this was also staph aureus pyogenic spondylodiscitis. So contrast imaging obviously is uh, routinely used in cases of suspected infection, and it helps to distinguish between the presence of phlegmon, which is an inhomogeneous um, enhancing inflammatory tissue. This is usually uh, treated with conservative management. And then we have the peripherally enhancing abscesses which require uh, drainage for disease resolution. So in these images, these are plain, plain T1 and post-contrast T1 uh, sequences in which you can see extensive enhancing um, like monous tissue uh, involving the paraspinal soft tissues, um, the pre-vertebral space, the erector spiny muscles are also diffusely enhancing. The epidural space is also diffusely enhancing um, and this was a, an ep, uh, epidural phlegmon. And additionally, you can see that there is this non-enhancing collection appreciated anteriorly on the right side um, in the pre-vertebral space, which was a abscess. So epidural infection, again, uh, contrast imaging will help differentiate between phlegmon and abscess. In these images, you can see that there is diffuse uh, enhancing um, inflammatory tissue in the epidural space that is between the periosteum of the vertebra and the um, uh, spinal cord and um, theca. And this is diffusely enhancing without any negative areas of enhancement. So this is an epidural phlegmon causing cord compression. And uh, in this case, there is non central non-enhancement Surrounding by, uh, surrounded by a peripheral enhancing area. This was an epidural abscess. And on the um, axial sequences, you can see that the um, abscess is compresses upon the cord. 
So um, coming on to tuberculosis, um, it's also called POTS disease of the spine. The thoracolumbar junction is most commonly affected. The uh, tuberculous infection will also involve the anterior aspect of the vertebral body. It will spread in a subligamentous fashion. So um, subligamentous fashion will be deep to the anterior longitudinal ligament and therefore tuberculous infection may traverse multiple vertebral levels in contrast to uh, pyogenic discitis. Again, uh, in contrast to pyogenic discitis, TB will spare the intervertebral disc space because uh, the mycobacteria, they lack the proteolytic enzymes to break down the disc itself. So therefore, there may be no abnormal T2 weighted signals within the disc space. As the disease progresses and results in vertebral collapse, destruction of the disc space may be seen in the late stages of the disease. So imaging uh, in POTS spine, um, like pyogenic spondylodiscitis, there is going to be signs of vertebral body edema and contrast enhancement as an indication of inflammation. Uh, however, in PB, there is going to be an increased propensity for developing paraspinal or epidural abscesses. However, in TB, the, uh, the enhancement around the abscesses is going to be uh, smooth in comparison to um, pyogenic discitis in which there is ill-defined thick walled enhancement. Fistulous tracts are more commonly observed in TB. Uh, Fistulous tracts to adjacent structures, such as the aorta and pleural space may also be present. These are images of uh, tuberculous spondylodiscitis, in which you can see that there is this non-enhancing area within the body of the vertebrae with smooth rim of peripheral enhancement. So this was an intraosseous abscess. And additionally, you can see that there is a thin walled uh, abscess within the right psoas muscle with negative area of enhancement and smooth peripheral enhancement, which was consistent with the psoas abscess. You can see that there's a, also a small micro abscess in the anterior epidural space as well with some smooth peripheral enhancement. These, this is another case of tuberculous spondylitis, which involves multiple vertebral uh, levels. At least three segments are involved and there is anterior wedging that is appreciated. You can see that there is end plate marrow edema. There is diffuse enhancement of the vertebral bodies on the post contrast sequences. And if you notice that the um, intervertebral disc itself does not show any D2, increased T2 hyperintense signal. So there's relative sparing of the intervertebral disc space in TB. And this was in MR that was done on this in the same patient approximately 19 months later, which showed com complete compression deformity and collapse of the L1 vertebra, resulting in posterior retropulsion and compression upon the cord. So in chronic cases of TB, the vertebral body changes include pony fragmentation, anterior vertebral osteolysis, and wedging deformities and complete loss of vertebral body height and severe kyphotic angulation deformity results, which is called the gibbous deformity in TB. So this is a, a very important table differentiating between pyogenic and tuberculous spondylitis on uh, MRI. So let's just quickly review it. Um, the paraspinal or intraspinal abscesses are more commonly observed in TB. The abscess walls are thin and smooth in TB and thick and irregular in pyogenic. The post-contrast paraspinal abnormal signal margins are ill-defined in pyogenic and relatively well-defined in TB. The um, uh, vertebral intraosseous abscesses are more common in TB. However, the disc abscesses are more common in pyogenic spondylitis. The um, vertebral body enhancement pattern is usually heterogeneous in TB and homogeneous in pyogenic infection. Um, there may be multiple body, vertebral body involvement due to subligamentous spread in TB, and there's usually less than two uh, vertebral body involvements in pyogenic uh, spondylitis. However, py pyogenic spondylitis can present with skip lesions, as I mentioned earlier. 
commonly involved region is the thoracic spine and TB and lumbar spine and pyogenic spondylitis. And uh, there may be normal to mild disc destruction in TB and there may be moderate to complete disc destruction in pyogenic um, spondylitis. Uh, bony destruction is more frequent and severe in TB and can give rise to the gibbous deformity and it is infrequent and or mild to moderate in pyogenic spondylitis. So um, other infections, um, brucellosis is also an infection that can be sometimes indistinguishable from spinal TB. However, brucellosis usually does not um, affect the paraspinal soft tissues as much as TB does. And the archite architecture of the vertebral bodies in TB is usually maintained despite the diffuse osteomyelitis. Fungal infection can also have non-specific imaging features of spondylodiscitis, and this often necessitates the need for biochemical or tissue diagnosis. So role of diffusion-weighted imaging uh, can be used in cases of suspected infection. DWI of the spine can distinguish particularly between modic type 1 and plate degenerative changes from discitis osteomyelitis. This is a common diagnostic dilemma in cases of a T2 hyperintense disc. So there is the sign known as the DWI claw sign. This um, basically, it, it, it is a paired claw-like hyperintense signals of diffusion restriction in the adjacent uh, end plates. This has a high negative predictive value for excluding infection. Um, in contrast, when there's diffuse uh, diffusion restriction or amorphous DWI hyperintensity with absent claw morphology, this predicts infectious spondylodiscitis. So these are images showing the claw sign. Um, the first image shows a characteristic linear hyperintense diffusion restricted abnormality along the end plates, giving a claw appearance. So this, this is highly predictive for um, type one and plate modic degenerative change. And uh, images three and four show amorphous and increased, diffusely increased DWI signal intensity involving the vertebral bodies as well as the intervertebral disc, which suggests infectious spondylodiscitis. Again, two imaging um, features differentiating between um, degeneration and infection. So um, on these images on the left side, you can see that there is end plate marrow edema with hyper intense signals in the um, adjacent disc. But you can see that the cortex, that is the T2 hypo intense line along the end plates is relatively preserved. And subsequently on DWI imaging, you can see the paired claw sign. So this was uh, suggestive for degenerative disease. And in contrast, on the right side, you can see extensive marrow edema along the end plates, abnormal configuration of the disc and loss of the T2 hypointense cortex. And uh, on subsequent DWI images, you can see diffuse or amorphous um, diffusion restriction, which successfully um, predicts infectious spondylodiscitis. So intramedullary infection, uh, infectious myelitis is, um, can progress to intramedullary abs or, or cord abscess formation, which is a rarely encountered phenomena. It is usually postulated in cases of systemic bacteremia and hematogenous seeding. Uh, sometimes they can be uh, indistinguishable from demyelinating conditions and differentiation is more likely to be achieved after clinical evaluation and laboratory investigations. So intramedullary T2 hyperintensity in cases of myelitis involves um, poorly uh, defined areas of hyperintensity with enhancement. These are typically early MR um, findings observed one week, uh, up to one week of acute infection. Following that, in the late stages of myelitis and abscess formation, there's going to be peripheral enhancement with a focal well-circumscribed area of T2 hyperintensity as seen in this image. And then there is surrounding edema and myelopathy in the cord. And on post-contrast images, you can see that there is this peripheral enhancement around the um, intramedullary abscess. And if DWI is performed, this can show restricted diffusion as seen in 
cases of brain abscesses as well. Additionally, contrast enhancement of the ependymal surface of the central canal can also be seen as in this image, you can see contrast enhancement along the central um, canal of the cord. This indicates that this is infectious ependymitis. Intramedullary TB is also rare, but can be seen. Uh, the early stage of tuberculoma is um, a non-specific myelitis that can be observed and there may be uniform enhancement. However, when calciation develops, uh, the lesion displays a characteristic target sign with central low T2 and T1 signals and high T2 signal rim with either vivid or ring enhancement. So on these images, you can see that there is a lesion involving the conus medullaris, which is rounded and T2 hypo intense. And you can see that there's this subtle rim of T2 hypo hyper intensity in the periphery. And there is edema in the cord as well, diffuse edema in the cord. On T1, uh, plain T1 images, it is ISO to hypo intense. And on post contrast sequences, you can see that there is ring enhancement. So this was an intermedullary tuberculoma. So um, let's talk about arachnoiditis. Um, arachnoiditis refers to inflammation or infection of the uh, spinal cord meninges and the uh, subarachnoid space. So it uh, usually presents with characteristic findings on MRI, especially involving the cord equina nerve roots. Um, in addition to, there may or may not be meningeal enhancement present. Um, but the uh, nerve roots, um, there's three types of patterns that can be observed. Um, the type one is when the nerve roots are clumped together and distorted. So on this image, you can see that the, there is clumping of the nerve roots, which are peripherally distributed um, and they are distorted in appearance. So, uh, and type two is when the nerve roots are adherent to the theca such that it results in an empty thecal sac sign. So on this image, you can see that the nerve roots are not visualized within the spinal canal and are completely adherent to the theca, giving rise to the empty thecal sac sign. And type three, finally, is when the nerve roots and theca are clumped together into a single soft tissue mass centrally, as seen in this image. You can see that there is single uh, soft tissue mass within the uh, center of the spinal canal and uh, the nerve roots are clumped together into this single um, soft tissue mass. 